you, you, you can't, you can, you can ignore a lot of things when you're a small company, but as soon as you get to be, you know, as soon as you have customers, let's put it that way, as soon okay. as you have customers, you pretty much have to start putting that infrastructure in place. And I think, you know, I think that there's a lot of traditional companies that are not doing it the most efficient way, mm -hmm. but they're still coping. Uh, there's a lot of companies that do it really well. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's any one model for those things that make it successful, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of processes in place and you know, it, it, it has to be there. But I mean, we run into that every day with at, at, at my current job is that, you know, you're trying to go fast and, you know, you get frustrated because somebody in quality or somebody in regulatory has said, well, you're not allowed to do that. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpri. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpri's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today has a lot of things going on, much like many of my guests, but this one in particular is man after my own heart. He's a serial entrepreneur in both the tech and fitness fields, much like me, a triathlete, but also certified yogi, something I do not have going on, uh, self-described geek and tech-obsessed. He's also a professional engineer. He's part of that cult of engineers we talk to from time to time. Welcome to the show, Stephen Davis. Hey, thanks for having me on. I guess I should say, Steve, you did prefer Steve, and I, I read that, and I went, I, I know you like the shorter version. Steve is, Steve is better. Uh, everybody <laughs> at my current job calls, still calls me Steven, but uh, yeah, it's a slow process. You didn't like forcibly send out a memo and say, hey, guys. It's, it's not worth it. <laughs> You know, when you when your legal name Stephen, that it gets on everything, and it uh, yeah, you know, you're kind of stuck with it, which it's not a bad thing. I mean, it, it is what it is, right? Well, I, I would say on the bright side, you have a relatively uncomplicated name. You would think the same thing of me. It's Jesse. There's you know not that many letters to it, but because I have no I in my name, um, a lot of people just think it's Jess, and I'm like, no, I don't like that. Please stop doing that immediately. <laughs> so I have some of that from time to time. I work with a gentleman that's it's Jesse and I, I made the mistake of uh, addressing an email to him with an I and he came back very quickly and said I think that's the girl version of the yes uh, and, and, and <laughs> no no I wasn't trying to make a point or anything I just yeah like, the, you're, you're composing five emails at a time <laughs> yeah no he, I think and he probably experiences it happens it, you try to correct people the only time it bothers me is when it's like say, uh, I'll, I'll say a business partner for a lack of a better term or, or a vendor that I'm working with consistently over a number of years and they just cannot yeah. get it. That's the only time where I'm like, come on guys, like you've seen this a number of times, you can, <laughs> you can do it. Um, so I wanna ask you because um, my assistant, you know, pulled over, uh, I'll say your credentials from LinkedIn and you make a very, you know, noted bullet point to say you're a professional engineer. And I kind of know or get the sense that engineering is kind of like a cult. Like once you're in, you're in for life, it's engineers and then there's everybody else. Is that, is there any truth to that? Uh, I mean, a, a little bit. Uh, it also depends on the field. I mean, uh, you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, a civil engineer, there's a lot of, uh, there's more, I mean, personally, I think there's more weight that goes along with that. You're building bridges, you're building buildings. Um, when you get into the electronics, uh, electrical systems, software engineering, you know, you've got computer scientists, you've got electrical techs. Um, there, there's less of a, a line there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it, it's just, yeah, different, different strokes for different folks, right? I mean, it, it all depends. I've got, you know, half of my guys that work for me currently are engineers. The other half are technicians or, or, or computer scientists. 
um, it, yeah, it really depends on the field, but it, there is a certain, uh, yeah, I mean, it, engineers tend to be a bit of a breed apart, uh, right. you know, attitudes and everything else, right? Uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's just a bit different for sure. Do you feel like, do you feel in, in your own little sub niche of engineering because you also do the athletic stuff? And that's kind of my part of my interest with the podcast in general is, you know, finding this, this intersection of people that don't quite fit into either the solely kind of jock quote unquote mold or the, you know, geeky mold, but, you know, hit that intersection. Do you find that or do you feel pretty at home? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable. I mean, it, it definitely, it stands out. Like I, I find it that when I'm, when I'm interacting with other uh, athletes, if you will, if, I'm, if I can be as bold as to call myself an athlete, um, they, they, they're, they're less concerned about what, what you do for a living. It's like, oh, you're, you're an engineer, you're this, you're that, who cares, right? Uh, as an engineer that, that goes out and, and you know, runs a 50 kilometer race, that is not normal mm -hmm. in the engineering you know, field. I mean, there's lots of engineers, there are lots of uh, professionals that are, uh, that are athletic and do things in their, own, their spare time, but it's not, it's not that common, right? So right. there's definitely, <clears throat> I mean, interestingly enough, you, you, you do get a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of credibility for, for, for participating in the, the athletic side of it uh, at work. I mean, regardless of who it is, I mean, whether it's the accountants or you know, the lawyers or whoever, um, yeah, the fact you're riding to work or you're doing this, or you're doing a race on the weekend is, is, is definitely unusual. But it's not, it not uncomfortable, let's put it that way. Right, right, right. You know, it's just, it's one of those things where, like I said, it's kind of the inspiration for the show, but also just my, I don't know, inquisitive nature about humanity and how we separate ourselves and, you know, both how we view ourselves and how others view us and these kind of like in groups and their overlaps. And it's just, it's fascinating to me just because I think from a personal standpoint, I don't, I'm sure I do because I'm human and fallible, but I don't try to treat anybody different than anybody else. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm not going to, like, I'm going to speak to you the same way I speak to a doctor or the same way I speak to a, a janitor or a teenager. Like, we're people, you have value as a person. Um, and that's not trying to be like PC or trying to keep up with whatever that's going on. I live in a bubble, but just, just knowing that all kinds of people have lots of potential and various things and come from all kinds of different backgrounds. So I, I guess I see it as interesting when people kind of self isolate or self segregate into, you know, their group of people, um, maybe possibly because I'm not sure I've ever felt like I really belonged in any one particular group. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's, I mean, I, I, I see what you're getting at and it, it and I think it's that, like he's pointed out, it's that cross section of, you know, uh, being a techie, but also being an athlete that it kind of sets you, I mean, it, you're, you're fine fitting in with your peers and whatever happened group you happen to be in, but you've always got that sort of label on you that says, okay, but you're, you're an engineer, but, oh, but by the way, did you know that he also does races or, you know, you're, you're a, you're a gym rat, but I didn't realize you were an engineer type thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, it all depends on, on, on where you are. I find that, that again, the, you know, hanging out with athletes, um, like I said, it's, it's, you, you find a much more diverse cross section of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of professions, uh, well, then I, then I get at work, obviously, because I'm surrounded by engineers. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's nice to have that, that sort of breadth of, uh, or diversity anyway, of, of, of interests. And, and, you know, I think it, sometimes I wonder in, in part because is it my particular bend that I speak to so many like triathletes and endurance athletes? Is it a matter of that's simply what's available to the adult athlete? You know, like, if you or I want to go play, I don't know, insert team sport here, doesn't really matter what it is. It's yeah. going to be pretty difficult to do that at all. I mean, we want to go play football. We want to go play soccer. We want to go play baseball. Like you got to put a team together. There's got to be multiple teams that practice regularly. Have a like, yeah. so I, but 
through that, um, beyond my diatribe, you know, there are a lot of very intelligent people in the triathlon community. So it's almost like you could just go to any, get any random race, just start picking random people out and then be like, Oh yeah, I, I'm an engineer. I, you know, I'm a doctor. I, you know, I'm a professional artist, like very, like very wide, but not well seasoned, but well accomplished people um, from all kinds of fields in that, that little microcosm. Well, and I think it, part of it is uh, just how, it, like you said, it's accessible, right? It, it, mm-hmm. it, like a team sport. I mean, it all depends on the teams you're talking about, you, you know, around here, uh, men's league hockey. Yeah. If you play in seven days a week, right. There's, there's people that just are desperate for people to play and I'm right. not very good, but I could be playing seven days a week. Uh, Soccer is probably the same thing. Um, I, you know, I don't know about anything about the softball or hard, you know, baseball uh, industry or, or the or field around here. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, the running and the triathlon is, is definitely accessible. And, and so you get everybody there and, and it's cool. You get a, a huge range of, of uh, abilities uh, in that as well, which is kind of cool. You know, I, I always um, just, this is, I guess this is the, both two things. One, the American in me, and then uh, me just living in a bubble. I always forget about the fervent nature of hockey um, <laughs> <laughs> and how it continues uh, pretty much for as long as people can get on ice and swing a stick. Um, it just, it's just, it's not in my realm. You know, I grew up in the Midwest. I still live in the Midwest in yeah. the U S I mean, we had a hockey team when I was younger, amateur hockey team, or maybe it was like a minor league hockey team, but we don't have a pro team here. Uh, yeah. I've never really watched it. My roommate watched it in college, but it's just, it's so outside my own, existence that sometimes I just forget that it's a thing yeah well and, and we, we you know we're, we're kind of the and not to pigeonhole everybody but you know we're kind of in the opposite there's, there's so much opportunity to play mm-hmm. that people tend to play beyond where they should be playing right so that you know we have ads on tv about you know what do they say they get fit to play hockey don't play hockey to get fit because you get people dropping dead on the ice all the time. So you get 55 year olds or 60 year olds and they're out there and you know, they're not as fit as they should be. And they literally drop dead on the ice and it is, but you know, everybody's doing it. (laughs) It's still, (laughs) there's, there's so much opportunity that uh, you just keep, you just keep playing and playing. So then do you not play because of the injury aspect or. I stopped playing hockey. I don't know, three years ago, mm-hmm. um, not because of injuries, just accessibility. Right. So I was, okay. playing, uh, I was playing in one league where we played at five o'clock, uh, on Thursdays, which is fine unless you're at work till five. Right. So that means you have to be in a job where you can leave work at four, you got to drive downtown, you got to get changed. Um, and you know, other people play at 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night, which is fine when you're 28. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, you know, if I play hockey at midnight, I'm not sleeping that night. Right. So it's uh, right. cause you're so wound up. So um, yeah, for me, it was just scheduling uh, and, and trying to fit everything else in around that. Um, and I've been in scenarios. I remember I was younger when I was playing, I was playing ball hockey uh, while I was training for triathlons and I was constantly paranoid about getting hurt because mm-hmm. right? you've, you've trained, you know, the whole winter you're getting ready for your season and the last thing you want is a sprained ankle or a, you know, a broken leg or a broken arm or something, right? Yeah. It stops you from, from participating. And so it's always a little bit, uh, you know, nerve wracking. Um, that being said, as I did both, I tore both my ACLs uh, playing soccer, playing mm-hmm. men's soccer. So that's, mm-hmm. you know, they were about five years apart, but, uh, you know, it definitely put a dent in, in doing anything uh, beyond that. So, you know, so I don't play soccer anymore. <laughs> yeah. I can sympathize with the uh, the reason I ask about the the injury thing is like I, I stepped away from uh, martial arts because of that because I was well at first because I was on scholarship in college running and then because I got very serious about triathlon post college yeah. but it's it's combat sport it's literally like <laughs> let's fight um, and the potential I don't know I can't recall a time where ever I had a serious injury um, though the 10, 11 years I was doing it was like uh, early childhood to late, 
late teens, you know, up to college. Um, so, you know, there's probably some resiliency in youth there a little bit. Uh, but, you know, it's just that potential for injury. And it's, it's a little disappointing, you know, to have to leave behind something that you're so interested in because there's something else that, you know, subsumes that or uh, assumes that, that position of number one. Um, but I guess that's life, just making prioritizing and figuring out what's the, the thing you got to do right now. Um, and, that you can't come back to. I find for myself anyway that that uh, that sort of the transition into a different sport is important. Right? Like I find that you know I've been running my whole life, but you know I did triathlons hardcore for ten years, and then I stopped for twenty years to raise my kids. And you know I I I did martial arts for three or four years in the middle there, and then you know I also just did straight weights for a while, and then you know got back into running, got back into triathlons. So it's just a, it's all about timing and, you know, it's hard to stay, it's hard to stay enthusiastic about one thing for, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I find it anyway, I mean, maybe that's just my, my nature, but uh, yeah, I find that it's nice to be able to pursue different things every once in a while. And yeah, yeah I feel bad about giving that up, or giving previous things up, but the transition is always, uh, is always exciting. See, and I wonder um, if we have this in common, I always felt like, so I did a, a lot of things. Um, I'll say as a kid, but as a youth, um, you know, I was involved in everything under the sun, music, art, athletics, you know, martial arts, running, um, youth group, Boy Scouts, just pretty much anything I had time for and did pretty well at the vast majority of it. But, you know, I found as getting older, it, you know, work takes place of a lot of things that takes a lot of time growing companies takes time and it's like you have to leave these things by the wayside and you know I I get maybe a little wistful I don't know um about just being a kid not having those responsibilities and, and kind of feeling like in some aspects um you know maybe I was more well-rounded at that point in time um but anyway I just saw so I'm just curious if if you were like me if you had a lot of interest as a kid or whether it was just one thing to the next well i mean i had a i had a, a lots of interest i mean i i was pretty you know, i was gonna say a pretty generic growing up i mean in high school uh i played hockey and soccer like most canadian kids you played soccer in the summer to stay in shape for hockey in the winter um but it, it you know it wasn't really until after university that i found my my running legs. I mean, I knew I was always a, a runner, but I didn't run long distance. I didn't do anything. Uh, after university, I got into, that's when I got into triathlons. And then you, you all of a sudden, the sort of light goes on, you realize, wait a second, I'm, I can do this. This is pretty good. And I'm getting better and I'm getting better. And it, uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, just, it just changes. But I mean, I've always been interested in, in different things. And like you said, it's just a matter of finding time mm -hmm. to do it, right? It, uh, you know, I, I, I remember I was going back through some old log books and I mean, I was training 20 hours a week before I was married. Right. Uh, and even after my, 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 my fiance at the time was, was very understanding and you know, was happy to, to let me do my thing. But uh, you know, then once you have kids and you've got a different job and, and you know, that sort of thing, I mean, some people still try to do it. I, I just couldn't, you know, wrap my brain around it. Mm -hmm. You know, and at the time I was, uh, I'm trying to think of the timing the time I was just starting a company, uh, you know, when we were working 60, 70 hours a week, mm -hmm. everything, yeah, it, it, like you said, it just priorities change and you, you fit in what you can. Uh, but yeah, trying different things, you know, like I, I did CrossFit for a year, a couple of years ago and uh, realized it was turning me into someone that couldn't run. So it, not to, not to pigeonhole all the, the, the CrossFit guys, but uh, you know, you start to bulk up too much. You, you go out for a run, you realize what's going on. Like my balance is off, my cadence yeah. is off, everything just changes. And it, uh, you know, it, it's fun, but it wasn't, uh, it just wasn't the right thing for me at the time. Well, in some ways, like strength and like high levels of cardio, high level running are diametrically opposed. I mean, you can obviously, and should in some aspects, strength train as a runner, but bulk it's gonna weigh you down like there are I, i'm a big proponent of lighter is not always better in running 
Um, and I've done a video on that on, on my running series. Um, and I experienced that myself coming from, I was like 130 pounds starting high school and then through kind of my fastest weight in, in triathlon where I ran my fastest 5k ever, 163 pounds, which is much heavier. So I'm 510 is much heavier than the average person would consider to be like optimal for my height. Yeah. Like optimal is supposed to be like low 150s, high 140s. And I, it just, yeah, that, I was racing at 155 in college in, I mean, doing well. I, I could have been leaner in college. So maybe I could have been there, but it's just, I think it, I think it belies the part about functional fitness. Like people always think there's these, you know, these studies that people rely on that say, oh, if you're, you know, for every pound you lose, you're two seconds per mile faster. It's like, okay, but the study is flawed in that they're like taking a person and giving them weight to hold, like adding a weight vest to them or something like that. It's like, well, it's completely non-functional fitness. It's not a fair comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my, my other thought talking about trying to fit everything in, I think about, um, he's retired now, but so now retired former pro triathlete, Jesse Thomas, um, that man, I don't know. His wife has to be awesome too. because what she's a pro runner. Um, he started this company picky bars. And so he's racing pro triathlon has a startup venture and then it had like two kids at the same time. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, he, it's, it's, it's Ironman distance since he, that he was racing too. So it's not even like, Hey, we're racing Olympic. We can put in 20, 25 hours. I, it seems Herculean sometimes to hear about those kind of things, those kind of like people getting all that done. Yeah, no, I went through a, I went through this, this extra, you know, mental exercise a couple of years ago when I was, uh, when I, so I, my, my specialty was always the Olympic distance triathlons. Like I did a, I did a couple of, you know, 60 K 60, you know, 60 K bike slash 15 K run sort of middle distance ones, but I'd never done a half, never done a full, full Ironman. Mm -hmm. And you know, decided to train for the half and realized that, you know, during the training, I was like, I want to do a full Ironman. This is easy. I can you know, make this happen. But then you start looking at the distances that you have to bike. And, you know, I, I knew guys that were doing it. They were spending six hours on a Friday morning doing their long ride. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, when am I going to do that? Like, it's yeah. just going to, you know, so I sort of said, well, when I retire, I'll, uh, I'll go into long distance triathlons. And I'm like, well, I'm not even sure when that's going to happen. Right. So it's, yeah. I'm not sure if they've got still have a 70 plus uh, age category in, in Ironman. But. Oh, I'm, they've got 80 plus. They've, <laughs> you've got time yet if you want to do it. And yeah. I know that the other thing is I know people will do it off of, you know, when I was doing 70.3, I was training, you know, 18 to 20 hours a week um, at, at peak, peak, peak mileage, more 15 to 18. And I know people that would do the foals off of that kind of training. I don't know that I could have, I think I would have been obliterated and I tried, tried to do that or it would have been just about finishing and that's just not my style. Yeah. Um, but I know it can be done off of less training. And I realized well, as I was doing the half that, uh, it, it's, it's all about what you're used to. Right. So I, I've been doing these, um, Spartan races, right. The, yeah. the long, you know, five hours of trekking in the mountains and, uh, you know, you do a couple of five hour races and you realize that you can do whatever you can do anything, right. You, you, you can put your body through anything. So, you know, I look at a half Ironman, I'm like, yeah, okay, I can do that. But at, to your point, I don't want to just finish. I don't want to be limping across the line at the end. I want to at least feel like I've pushed myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there's definitely levels of, uh, you know, levels of performance that you're prepared to deal with. And, yeah, I'm sure you could go and knock off a full Ironman today, right? If you wanted to, but it's not going to be pretty. And no, like no, that. it's going to be lots of walking, yep. walk running at the end. Oh yeah. 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 And so, no, I mean, it's, it's all what, what you've got time to time to deal with. Right. Yeah. Well, like you said, it's kind of like the um, personal expectation, right? You just, you know, do you want to finish? Well, I could, I could probably finish, but that's, 
I have higher expectations for myself. I also know, at least personally, um, I tend to push it at the edge where if I don't have the proper fitness, I'm either going to like bonk or black out or it's going to be a bad place for me physically that could potentially be dangerous depending on yeah. how far you go because I've spent so many years working on ignoring that internal regulator that tells you to stop. Yeah. Well, not the, exactly. As soon as you start doing long distance, you, you, and I think you, you know, you end up with a, a couple of bricks loose. I mean, it, it you, you, you look at, you, you start doing things and you're like, I shouldn't be doing this, but I got to finish. So I got to make sure it mm -hmm. happens. Yeah, no, I, I agreed. You have to be, uh, you have to be careful about everything at that, uh, at that point. I mean, and I, 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 you know, when I was younger, I, I, I literally had a hard time, you know, I, I left triathlon for a year and tried to get back into it. And everybody was saying, well, just do it for fun. Just enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah, you don't understand. That's the, that's, those are the people on the outside going, Hey, just do it for fun. You're like, no, you don't. That's like, get it. Like, I always say this. Um, I mentioned my niece who's of a similar age to me. She's only a few years younger because my, my brother is much, much older than me. And she, often ask me, well-intentioned, hey, are you doing a triathlon this year? And I'm like, I, I don't think you understand what it is, this thing that I do. It's, it's all encompassing. I use her as an example because it, it's just part of my life, but it's that, that like well-intentioned attitude that just doesn't quite understand what the culture is. Yeah, like a couple summers ago, I think I did 20 races. Yeah course i mean it, it, there was a couple of winter ones in there as well but yeah running and spartan and triathlon like you just yeah you, you, you're trying to figure out where to put all the stupid medals that you get it, uh, yeah. <laughs> they just i don't know where I, I i think i put them in a box when we moved to this house i think i put them in a box and then well in this i mean this last year all the races were canceled previous year i did a few and i think i mean july i think it's july night of 19 is the last time I've done a race because everything got, got canceled this last year that I was signed up for. And so I've now had to worry about sticking, <laughs> sticking medals anywhere recently. Yeah, no, that's true. I'm, I'm pretty much the same, but uh, yeah, no, it, it, it just, the, the, not everybody gets that, you know, or, you know, this, these Spartan races, they, uh, they would run three races on a weekend. Mm -hmm. You'd go in and do a, you know, you'd race Friday, get up, race Saturday again and get up and race Sunday. And, uh, yeah, people are like, well, how, how did you enjoy the race? I go, well, there was, there was three, but, uh, you know, still fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's definitely, uh, until you've done it, it's, it, it's hard to, to un get other people to understand for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have to ask you a bit about, um, being a subscribed serial entrepreneur and I, I guess the, the tech and fitness, you know, aspect makes sense given your personality and interests um so uh tell me a little bit about i guess the journey you know how do you end up you know being dumb like me and going down an entrepreneurial road and and as you mentioned earlier working 60 70 hour weeks as you're starting things up yeah. uh i mean it, it i don't know that there's ever a conscious decision i mean part of it i think for me anyway is that my my dad uh started a company when he was when i was in grade seven. So I don't know how old that is, 12, 13. Um, so I grew up around that environment. I mean, mm -hmm. he was, you know, he, he seemed to be perpetually starting a company. Um, it was always the same one. I mean, he's running the same company now. My, my brother runs it. Um, my dad's retired, but, uh, so I was always around that entrepreneurship and always around that sort of self-employment thing. And yeah, it just kind of, to be honest, the first, the first one just kind of fell in my lap. I was mm -hmm. consulting. Uh, I ended up with too much work. I brought a partner in. We ended up with too much work. We ended up, there were six of us uh, after a while and, and, you know, we were doing a good business. Uh, this was right sort of before the, the dot-com bubble of 2000 uh, was just starting. Um, and uh uh, after that, we, we both ended up going our own way after about five years of, of running our own company. Um, he jumped onto a, a dot com. I jumped onto a dot com. Um, and it, it, 
you know, but the, the, the desire never goes away, right? So after that uh, flamed out, like most of the, you know, 90% of the tech did, um, I, I was probably in a series of, of startups uh, some of them were mine and some of them were what, uh, other companies that I just, you know, friends were starting them or, or colleagues. Um, and I, I jumped in to, to help out. But the, the urge just never goes away, right? You always are looking, if you've got that mindset, you're always saying, well, not so much I can do it better, but there's an opportunity here for me to build something. And, and I've, I've always considered myself a builder, whether it's my own company or, or somebody else's. And I've been in I've been hired more than once to uh, to come in and build a team and build the product. So I, I, I found a lot of the conversations I was having with people were, you know, we want to build something. We want it to be this big and we want it to be blue. How much is it going to cost and how are you going to do? How do we do that? And, I, you know, OK, I'll build that for you. And, then, and so I would end up partnered up with a lot of non-technical uh, people mm -hmm. and, and just building building that thing for them um which in, you know invariably leads you down the path as ah, i can do this better than they can <laughs> uh but uh yeah it's been sort of a whether i'm doing my own thing or whether i'm doing uh working inside another company i have you know more often than not been building something from scratch so i mean even this latest job with canopy mm -hmm. uh, i was brought in as sort of the fourth person in, into the team to, to basically build the software side of, of, you know, we're doing consumer electronics. You need, you need software, you need apps, you need websites, you need everything. Uh, I was brought in to build that team from scratch. And so, you know, and that's where we are, where we are now. I mean, I've taken over the whole team. So I have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, software guys working for me, but uh, you know, it's basically a team that myself and a couple other guys built and uh, you know, so we're, we're, it's like a startup inside a bigger company, which is the best place to be because there's money. Right. You got all the funding. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're a lot less worried about trying to find that next, uh, your next paycheck or your next, uh, you know, forget about your own paycheck, find the paycheck for the people that are working for you. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, so last week I spoke up, uh, spoke to um, another startup guy, uh, Alex French, who's, he actually is kind of like, where I am now and then went more your direction, took VC, um, venture capital, and then has pushed his company forward. I kind of live in lifestyle land where it's, you know, it's me. Uh, you obviously spoke with my assistant, Ira, who does a, a lot of things for me. And then I have a, another lady I work with who does my video editing, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's, it's just the three of us. So I'm the only full time person running both of my companies. Um, and so anytime I'm speaking to people like you or Alex who are in this place of, well, I'll call it more corporate environment in that you, you have the ability to build a team and get people and, and roll faster. It just, it's fascinating to me because I have no idea what that's like. I've never worked in a co corporate environment and I wonder, you know, I wonder, am I missing out on something? Should I be doing something else? Um, and so I, I guess through the various kinds of setups and teams you've seen over the years, like, is there a preferential way you like working? That's a good point. A good question. I, in general, I, I prefer smaller teams. I prefer the non, you know, the company I'm at now, I think we've got 3000 people, 3000 employees. We've got 10 different locations. Um, I mean, the headquarters is here. There's probably a thousand people in Ottawa that, that are working for the mm -hmm. company. Um, you know, you could ask anybody that knows me. I, I don't do big corporate well. Uh, I mean, honestly, I'm too outspoken. I don't, you know, I don't have a filter. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't go over well all the time. Um, but it's definitely nicer from a from a support and financing perspective you're not scrambling you're not worried you know you're not trying to explain to the guys why you can't make payroll um but i but i i'm definitely more comfortable in that that small scale startup type environment um but but it, you know financial finances are always an issue right and uh so 
you know, what I found is that companies go through this, you know, assuming it's a funded, a funded company, um, you get all your money in and everybody's excited and you, you build your product and you get to a point where you have to start selling it and then it becomes real. And all of a sudden you're, you're running out of money and you've got to sell stuff and then everybody gets cranky and it's not so much fun anymore. Right? <laughs> and you got to do real stuff. Yeah. And, and not everybody can cope with that, that change, that sort of transition from, you know, building to, to selling. And uh, I'm not saying I don't, you know, I'm not saying I don't know how to do it better any, than anybody else, but uh, there's, there's an appeal to both sides, but uh, you know, being in charge of a team and, and having a, a very tight knit team that's all going in the same direction. That's where I like to be. Right. And, and whether it's a, you know, I've got 35 guys now, you know, that's probably one of the biggest groups I've, I've run. Um, you know, it, it, a 10 person team is, is just as much fun, uh, especially if they're all going in the same direction, mm -hmm. uh, working on exciting things. And then at the end of the day, the, the 70 hours a week doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. You just, you don't even notice it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely that sort of fast moving, uh, you know, exciting environment that, that appeals to me. It's that, the, it's that upfront investigation that the unknowns is how do we solve this problem? Okay. You, you, you're going along. Now you got a roadblock. How do we get by that? Okay. We'll we fix that. What's the next thing. And, uh, that's, you know, I'm a builder, if you will. It, uh, right. Like, yeah. I mean, that's the engineer at heart, right? Or it's like, Exactly. You want to build things. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if it's, I assume it's the same for, for most engineers, right? I'm a, I, I, I can manage, I mean, I've done software pretty much my whole career. Uh, I've dabbled in hardware, uh, like electronics. Um, I couldn't lay out a board to save my life. Um, so, but then you know, I get into mechanical engineering and, and 3d design and stuff like that. And it, it, it's frustrating that I don't know how to do it. Like I want to be able to do everything myself, but you can't. You have to rely on people to, to, and I mean, to be honest, I don't do anything anymore. I just tell people what to do. <laughs> I don't actually get to build anything. Um, my last job, my, uh, my lead developer locked me out of our code repository because I kept going in on the weekends and changing things. And he got frustrated because he, you know, I said, look, I'm the CTO. I'm allowed to do whatever I want. He goes, yeah, but stop writing, you know, stop fixing stuff that's already, already working because you're just breaking it. Right. But, uh, anyway, it, <laughs> Well, thinking about, again, it's just a, a personal curiosity. Um, thinking about like a very large company versus small, nimble team. And, you know, talk, you're talking about being outspoken, which maybe that's why I've eschewed corporate life. Um, I don't like being told what to do. Although I'll, the caveat there is I don't like being told what to do by people I don't respect. So yeah. there, that, that's the thing, right? Um, but I think about you know, if I'm trying to organize 3000 people, like you've got to have systems and procedures in place and like everything has to be dictated. Otherwise you like, you, you're not going to get this mass moving in the same direction. Right. So I, I wonder how much of maybe both of our distaste for that setup is simply a necessity of having a company that size. I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it, it has to be, there has to be all that infrastructure in place for it to work. Right. Like you, you, you can't, you can, you can ignore a lot of things when you're a small company, but as soon as you get to be, you know, as soon as you have customers, let's put it that way, as soon okay. as you have customers, you pretty much have to start putting that infrastructure in place. And I think, you know, I think that there's a lot of traditional companies that are not doing it the most efficient way, mm -hmm. but they're still coping. Uh, there's a lot of companies that do it really well. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's any one model for those things that make it successful, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of processes in place and, and it, that, that has to be there. But I mean, we run into that every day with, at, 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 at my current job is that, you know, you're trying to go fast and, you know, you get frustrated because somebody in quality, or somebody in regulatory has said, well, you're not allowed to do that. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, but, but, but no, nope, this is the way it has to work. You know, we've, we've, we've already gone through this, you know, this is the way it has to work. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I definitely, I understand the necessity of it. 
doesn't mean I like it. I understand the necessity of the necessity of it. So is that you know before we got going, we were talking about um, we're talking a little bit about public speaking and just having what you know what the podcast is, and uh, you you know you were talking about um, kind of the best speeches you've given you didn't really prepare for. Um, and, and I will actually counter your own argument by saying you just didn't write down what you're going to say. You were prepared to give them by your experience and time, but you didn't necessarily say, this is exactly what I'm going to say in such, such and such order. Is it that kind of, um, I don't want to say almost looking for serendipity in a way where like things just come together in the moment. Is it, is it, you know, that idea that you enjoy about the small nimble teams of just being able to, you know, kind of freestyle, so to speak, uh, to get things done versus having to go through all the bureaucracy? Well, yeah, I mean, that part of it is, is the ability to get things done. Part of it is just the ability to uh, be in the conversation, right? So in a small company, you know, <clears throat> I remember telling, I, I, I interviewed at one company and at one point the CEO, and I mean, the company was 50 people, the CEO comes into the interview or it might've been after I got hired, but he said, you know, why do you want to work here? Or why a small company as opposed to a big company? And I said, you know, at the end of the day, if I can't go into the CEO's office and tell him what I'm thinking and have a logical conversation with him and, and participate at least in some way in that, that how does the company run, you know, it, it's frustrating, right? If you've got five layers between you and the person that's making the decisions, uh, you feel helpless. Mm -hmm. And after being in small companies where you have that access, it's hard to go the other way. And it's hard to sit back and say, well, I don't know, you know, I don't have the ability to have a conversation with our CEO. I don't have the ability to have a conversation with my VP. Um, I'm stuck here talking to the people around me, which is fine, but I, I want to have, I want to be involved with everything. And you lose out on that in, in the bigger companies. And it, uh, I think that's probably something that I've always been, you know, looking for is just the ability to, to have an impact on, on, you know, whatever, um, and, and part of that's personality. I, I'm not satisfied with just sitting back and doing the technical aspect. I want to interact with marketing and I want to interact with, you know, customer support and, and the sales guys and understand how they're selling product, uh, how are we marketing product, right? So, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's that diversity of, of, uh, of, of items or things you can get involved with that's, uh, that's fun in a small company. It, it, you saying that kind of, reminds me of uh, one of the blog posts you wrote about, um, and I'm going to misquote you, so please correct me as I stumble through this, um, thinking about like um, kind of R&D and in-house development versus like executives wanting to bring outside individuals in to solve a problem. Yep. Um, so I think about this too, and it really shouldn't be a concern of mine, um, given that I'm uh, essentially a one-man team. Um, but, you know, I think about structure. And I, I like systems and systems building and all that kind of stuff. And I wonder how do you keep, can you keep that spirit of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and like nimble R&D in a large environment where by necessity you have to, you know, push people through this, thousand cog machine to keep everybody moving is it possible to do both it is but there has to be very much a, an upper management buy-in if if you know and and, and you know, i'm not going to i'm going to try to avoid criticizing my current company um we do have a uh we st we are still a young company uh we've happened to grow very big very quickly but there is still a a a, a sense or an environment of, of let's get things done quickly, um, which is, which is good, right? So they're, they're, they want to get product to market. They want to get product to market in good time. The size of the company is less relevant to that. I mean, bigger companies tend to, to put processes in place that slow everything down, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the bonus of that is that it makes them robust and reliable and, and long lived, right? You get a lot of startups that'll crank out something really great uh, and really quickly. And then they, you know, the customers, they find a problem in the field and the customers don't like something and they just flame out. 
right? Because they have no ability to to cope with with the problems that come up downstream. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to have the stability of the company to to support that while still trying to you know be nimble within it. Um, but it's definitely a top down that has to be driven from the top down because you can very quickly um, stagnate on an idea or on a, on a whole company can stagnate very quickly. Uh, I mean, I think the, the blog post you're referring to is more about, um, I'm trying to remember the exact word, but destructive innovation, if you will, mm -hmm. which is, you know, and it is a problem. It's, it's, it's not easily solvable, right? I mean, the, the, the best description I ever heard of it is, you know, if you can ever come up with a successful product, the company that customers want, sell the idea and start another one, because that's the, that's the best you're ever going to be is that you've got the idea and people want it. So it's only downhill, from, it's only downhill from there. Um, but, but it's a way of continually encouraging your team to, to do the next thing because companies, well, and, and, and rightly so, they become addicted to revenue. Mm -hmm. They become addicted to that dollar and they're, they're afraid to go off that path. They're afraid to deviate from where, um, you know, the customers want, you know, they've got 99 features, they want 100. Okay, let's work on that one feature. But you don't realize there's somebody in another company that's working to get to take away your customers because they're developing something better. You should be developing that something better and be prepared to give it to your own customers. But that's a very, very rare thing in industry is to 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 want to uh, cannibalize your own product. Mm -hmm. Right? You want to make sure your customers give you that 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 renewal or that next dollar that they've got. Um, so, which is why you tend to see innovation coming from outside the big companies um, just because they just can't, they can't f get away from that, that addiction to their existing customer base. And so um, it, it's a hard thing. And that's why you, you, you see a cycle. And even though you say, well, you know, Twitter's never going to disappear or my skate or my <laughs> Facebook's never going to disappear. But I mean, people remember MySpace, and it was the right. big, I mean, it was never going to disappear. And then it did. Um, you're seeing right now, I mean, Twitter is a perfect example of this. And I mean, it's incredibly politically charged, but mm -hmm. you're seeing people bail from Twitter now because they, you know, they tried to get, you know, they tried to get too involved with what's on their platform. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were being asked to, I mean, everybody was saying you got to get rid of the, the, the Nazis and you got to get rid of, rid of the anti-Semitism. It's the right thing to do. They might have locked it down a little bit too hard, and now you get all these people fleeing to Parler, Parler, yeah, and Gab, and all these other platforms, Rumble, um, because they feel like they're getting locked down. And does that mean it's the end of Twitter? I don't know, right? But you can see how it 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 doesn't take a lot for that that new person to come in, and now it's everybody just goes there, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially when there's no there's no real baggage. I mean, if you've got you know, if I bought a you know, I'm not going to go and buy a new laptop. I mean, I, I, I use a Mac, uh, you know, I, I may or may not switch back to Windows, but that's a big deal to, to switch that. But to move from one social media platform to the next is not that big a deal. Yeah. And so there's always going to be somebody else that, that comes and eats your lunch. Uh, and and <laughs> yeah. you know, a little bit better at that, the easier to, to do that with a big company. Yeah, as I, I think about it, it's like, it, it's tough to say, well, it's like my, my, my product's already working. It's already selling. People already like it. Yeah. Why would I make it different? Because I, I think it's the difference between if you're you know, competing with the already established player, you've got nothing to lose. You don't have anything established yet. So if you try something that doesn't work, well, you're no worse off than you were before. You had nothing. You still have nothing. Yeah. Versus I have something, if I change it, I could screw it up and there could be backlash. It reminds me mm -hmm. of Kraft Mac and cheese. So I was glad you, I'm glad you said something about eating people's lunch. It, <laughs> it, it, I don't know if you know about this, but I, I read about this story where, you know, Kraft Mac and cheese is just cheap box Mac and cheese that, you know, everybody under the sun, at least that I know has had, Powdered cheese is like its own flavor. It's not really like cheese. Um, it turns everything orange. And Kraft innovated on their product, made the product, I don't know if it was plant-based or natural, but something along those lines. They, they improved the ingredients. 
They changed how they were making it. And they didn't tell a soul until they'd been selling it for several months. Okay. And then they're like, oh, surprise, what you've been eating is actually our new product and it tastes exactly the same. So that they avoided that, that, you know, that initial backlash of, oh no, you're changing my favorite thing. Yeah. And they snuck it in there. I thought that was very clever of them to both innovate and then get around that, that backlash, even though, you know, you can, I experienced this even on a microcosm. Like I had, I brought a product out and ended up being I'll say defective for a lack of a better term. I recalled everything. I reworked the formula, brought it back out. And then people are like, Oh, this part's different. And I'm like, no, that part is literally unchanged. Like there, there's, there's zero difference, but there's this perception of, I know it's different. So like you're like hypersensitive about, Oh, it, there's gotta be something. So anyway, I, I thought it was really clever, clever on, on craft's part to, to yeah. do it that way. Oh, for sure. Well, and I'm sure a lot of people have taken runs at craft dinner uh, yeah. successfully, which is you know a testament to their, the, their marketing and their, their longevity. But yeah, uh, yeah for sure. It, uh, you, you don't always want to tell everybody, don't always announce what you're changing right off the bat. <laughs> right. Right. Just let it come out. And then I, and that's, I guess that's a nice part of that strategy too, is like they could have brought it out. And then if they had a lot of people initially saying something's different, something's not right. I don't like it then they yeah. know it's honest feedback because they didn't tell anybody that it's different. It's an actual perceived change. Yeah. So I keep that one in my, in my, my back pocket thinking about the future. And I'm like, if I <laughs> change yeah. something, just don't tell anybody um, <laughs> and just see what happens. Yeah. And go from there. Um, so Steven, as we're Steve, as we're kind of wrapping down on time, um, I have a habit at the end of episodes, every season, I have an overarching question. I ask every single guest. So, um, you get to be the second person to answer this question this year. Um, I'm asking everybody this year, how do you stay motivated after failing to reach a goal? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it, 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 it I guess it depends on, on how you define failure. Uh, I mean, for me, it, it's really comes down to the challenge. It, it, you know, I don't ever see something as a failure as much as it's, it's, you know, it sounds cliche. It's a, it's a learning experience, right? You've, you tried to go somewhere, you tried to do something, you didn't get there. Um, and, and well, by God, I'm going to do it better the next time. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it the next time. Right. And it, uh, yeah, for me, it, it's, it's, it's never really, that thought process doesn't really happen. It, it's more, um, you know, I, I got partway there. I got to where, where I wanted to be, but there's always room for improvement. And yeah, it's, it's really just about setting goals uh, and, and getting, setting goals logically. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I remember back in the day, the, the, you know, when I, when I first started doing triathlons, I was, plodding along I was you know I, I finished them I was doing okay but then you start seeing that improvement year after year mm -hmm. and you realize that uh, you've got so much and you can see obviously where the guy that's winning or the woman that's winning winning the race is going and you know you start doing the math and you start trying to figure out how am I going to get there how do I you know how do I trim seconds off here and there but you know you don't go out and and you don't set out to, to, to do an Olympic distance triathlon in two hours your first year, right? You, you, you know, unless you're already uh, an Olympic class runner or Olympic class biker, then you're, you're not going to get there, but you, you just sort of incrementally improve as, as you go along. Right. You know, I didn't try to do a, a Spartan ultra my first year. Mm -hmm. um, I would have failed miserably. Um, but you know, the third year along, I, you know, I set out and did the 52 K and, and, you know, you know, it hurt like hell, but um, at the time it was achievable and, and I knew that it was achievable. And, and, you know, I guess I, I, I could have missed the cutoff, you know, I was lucky I didn't, but um, yeah, it's just about setting up, setting appropriate goals in my mind anyway. And, and uh, for me, I'm, I'm, 
my my brothers are and my sister are very competitive we're a competitive family so it's i grew up you know with the with the drive to be competitive and uh yeah it's it, you know it, it, it's very hard to define something as a failure in in my mind mm-hmm. it, it's always just you know i got part way there and, and i'll get there the next time it's a good answer uh, steve if uh people want to so your blog posts, your rants, keep up with you, any of that kind of stuff, where can they find you? Uh, uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest or, you know, my, okay. my website where my blog is uh, Dan Largo, D-A-N-L-A-R-G-O.com. Um, it's not the most active these days, but that's where all of my, that's where I am. That's where all of who you know, my blog posts and, and my resume, everything else is, is there. Sounds good. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Steve. Oh, this is great. I really appreciate the, uh, really appreciate you asking me to come on. Absolutely. Take care.